and start the stream because I know it takes a while for notifications to go out. So in about five minutes, um, I'm gonna start the AI chat. We're gonna talk about artificial intelligence. In the meantime, I'm just gonna sit here. <laughs> so uh, it seems like when I start right on time, it takes a while for people to start flooding in. So if I'm gonna have sort of a scheduled show with content, I thought I might start the stream a little bit earlier and hopefully that doesn't bug anybody. So um, let me know if there's a better way to do it. Otherwise, I'll do something like this and I'll just keep something like this on the screen. That's me doing that. That's not AI. It's not AI doing facial recognition. That's manual, that's human. It's true intelligence. <clears throat> having fun already all right let's put it over here nobody is watching yet so it's good I'm glad I did this um, so I'm just gonna put maybe this up I'm still here but I don't know what's better this what's more obvious or this that says starting soon not that anybody's here yet but <clears throat> I have an agenda and everything there it's just felt a notification on in my pants so <laughs> that's a good sign that means if anyone is interested in jumping in here they'll have an opportunity to so I'm gonna close some of the stuff I have open <clears throat> Yes, we are starting soon. I'm gonna I'm gonna wait until one o'clock. I got about four more minutes. So and I even I have an agenda and everything. And I might nobody might even watch this because when I put it to YouTube, I'll probably trim it. So I'm basically just talking to myself, just practicing in front of the mirror, a very elaborate, expensive mirror. <laughs> Let's check my scenes. This is my left, this is my whiteboard scene. And also, it's my screen share scene, which I might not use. And I'm also gonna play music. And this is really for me, so I'm not really taking any uh, input. <laughs> Today we're gonna hear Trace Ombrace by ZZ Talk. And that's all there is to it. Uh, so I'm not quite started yet. I'm just giving people a chance to, uh, well, this is tricky because it's, it's mirrored, or it's not mirrored. I bet AI would do a better job at this than me. Well, see it? Ah, so when I go left, I have to... Okay, I got it. I got it. It took a while. See, it's a mirror image, so when I move the thing to, the, to my left with my hand, it goes this way. Short-circuiting my brain. Um, three more minutes, I'll start the show. In the meantime, I'm just messing around. Uh, feel free to chat if you want to chat or bring something up. Um, otherwise, I'll have real content in a few minutes. Eventually, I'll just animate this. There's so many things you can do on Twitch. It's very cool. Um, aside from like things popping up on the screen. If anybody follows me, it like pops up on the screen, which is cool. Chat pops up on the screen. Too. I know most of you guys know this, but this is all new for me. <laughs> nice name. <laughs> um, I've never thought Nementa would use Twitch for something serious. This account is for trolling. Great. So, you're tacky on, on, the, on the forums. Great. Uh, yeah, that, that, that name. Not, not good. Uh, anyway. Uh, there's a Discord... If you want to chat in Discord, you know where to find it. Um, I don't. I don't know how to say your name, Dyrick88. Is that right? A <laughs> uh, couple more minutes and we'll start. In the meantime, I'm just messing around. Yeah, go to Discord. Where is it? Uh, go to HTM Forum. There's a link there, and there's also on my Twitch page a link down there that says Discord, and you can click it. But I'm not. I have Discord open right now, but I'm not. Um, I'm not paying attention to chats there. I'm paying attention to Twitch chats. So, 
Uh, that's what I want. Just a couple more minutes and I'll get started. Maybe like one minute. I think, oh, one minute, there we go. Is that music too loud? It's not through the computer audio, so it's hard to tell. Dietrix, Dietrix, okay. Dietrix, is that right? Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, if you've got something to say uh, or something to comment on, just use the chat here. I'm sure we can all get over your name. <laughs> uh, Dierix. Dierix. All right. Uh, all right, let's get started because it's about that time. It is one o'clock. So I'm going to remove. Wait. I'm still trying to figure out the Twitch interface. Here we go. I'm going to turn this off. I still have chat up. Um, and I'm going to talk about. AI stuff. So I wanted to start real basic. So um, I wanted to talk about terms because the terms can be confusing, honestly. What is artificial intelligence versus machine intelligence versus machine learning? Because they all honestly feel like different things to me. First of all, artificial intelligence, the term, I really dislike. I've never felt comfortable with it. Because what is artificial? About, if we create intelligence, what is artificial about it? It's not artificial. It's like saying artificial life. If you create something that we categorize as life, it's no longer, it's not artificial. It either is life or it isn't. It is intelligent or it isn't. There's no artificial in any aspect in my head. Uh, so I hate the term artificial intelligence. I think you should call it biological intelligence or non-biological intelligence, which is why I like the term machine intelligence because that's the closest thing to non-biological intelligence. That's what we're working on. Machine intelligence. That's what people say. Artificial intelligence equals, equals human made, but the term's wrong. Let's call it what it is. It's, it's machine intelligence. But that's what I like to call it. So I try, you have to use the term AI in, in today's world because it's a huge hype term, but um, I don't like to use it. I would rather call it what it is. We're working on non-biological intelligent systems and we specifically are looking towards biological systems to better understand them. So um, machine learning now I think is, is I, I think of as a field of artificial intelligence research. Um, and it's all obviously machine intelligence too. Um, let's just ignore this term. Let, let's, let's call it machine intelligence instead of artificial intelligence. I'll just do that. And then we can, but I'm gonna change, I'm gonna keep the name of the, of the channel or the, the chat of course, because that's how people recognize it. Nobody's gonna go to machine intelligence chat, right? Um, so anyway, when we're talking about machine intelligence, machine learning is a type of machine intelligence and it sort of is everything we've got today um, can be sort of be categorized as machine learning. Uh, people use this, these, these two terms also interchangeably, but I like to refer to machine learning as uh, encompassing all the artificial neural networks that we're building today. Um, I think if you talk to someone that was doing deep learning, they would say they're, they're working on mach in machine learning. Uh, and, and, and if there, anyone is using artificial neural networks, they probably tell you they're working in machine learning. Um, so that term sort of uh, exists in a, in a more technical way for the engineers that are, and the implementers that are working on it. They, they like to use that term when they're talking about specific implementations. Um, I never refer to HTM as machine learning necessarily, but you could, you could call it that. I like to use the term machine intelligence um, <clears throat> because um, it's more descriptive. We're, it's not, we, we want it's the intelligence bit we're trying to crack. We can make things learn. That's easier than making something intelligent. You have to learn to be intelligent. So we're partially there, but. Um, okay, so that's sort of the terminology bit I wanted to get past. Um, and by the way, if anyone has questions at any time, just pipe in um, on chat. At some point, I'll get the voice thing working in Discord, um, but not today. So in addition to this terminology, I also want to talk about strong versus weak AI. And I want to be really clear. Everything that humans have created up until this point is weak AI. The only thing that is strong AI on this planet is biological intelligence. The difference is, is hard to say sometimes because people have 
different definitions of what defines intelligence. There's the Turing test, which I think nobody really uses much anymore. And you know, there's other methods of trying to decide if something is intelligent. I don't, I don't necessarily want to talk about those methods, but there's a difference between things that are um, sort of intelligent or locally intelligent or you know, able to apply learning in interesting ways in, in very, grand, in very uh, specific fields, right? That, the weak AI stuff that we have today, like I said, all of it, everything we have today's weak AI is uh, super impressive. There's, there's a lot of stuff um, that you can do with weak AI and I'll talk a bit about that um, later as we talk about sort of different forms of AI. Um, but what we're really striving towards is strong AI. What we really want and what we really need is strong AI. The reason self-driving cars don't work today is because we don't have strong AI. Um, everything we have is weak and you can't shove a bunch of weak AI systems together and, and create strong AI. And I, and I really don't think that these systems will naturally evolve into strong AI systems. I think there must be some form of paradigm shift for today's weak AI systems to make the jump to strong AI. Um, and I'll, that's a topic of conversation on this channel, which I'll talk about later. Um, so you can say AGI instead of strong AI. If you want to use that term, uh, it's pretty much the same thing. But when you, and a way I like to think about it is if you are strong AI, you understand things. And that's a, that's a loose term, but, um, but I think it's an appropriate term. You can't say that your photo album software that looks at all your photos and says, oh, there's Steve, there's Steve, that's Steve, that's Steve, that's Jill, there's Steve, that's Jill, that's Muhammad, blah, 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 all through your, your photos. Do, does that AI, does that system understand your, your relationships with your friends? Does it understand that these are humans? Does it understand what a human life is? Does it understand the environments that these things exist in? It doesn't understand anything. It has no understanding of reality in any way. That's what we need for strong AI, something that can model the world in a way that it makes sense internally. So that when you, predict, when you make an action against the world, you understand it well enough to predict what will happen in that environment. That's strong AI. That's what we're trying to strive for. Um, I say we, I sort of mean humanity in general. I also mean the company that I work for. Our goal is to understand intelligence, how it works in the brain, and to create intelligent systems in non-biological non ways. Okay, so weak versus strong, um, I went over. Um, any questions, feel free to add them in chat. I think most of you guys probably, this is like a review. Um, but um, I was hoping that some, some folks from, from Twitch that I've been interacting with that might be interested in learning a bit about AI from the ground up would, would join in too. So if you have any questions, let me know. Even if they seem dumb, I don't mind. There is no stupid question. Um, all right, so let's talk about a diff some different types of AI. And uh, I'm still using the term AI because you have to. Um, so I like to talk about old AI. And this stuff, you might call it classic AI. But this stuff has been around for decades and decades. It's uh, a lot of this is is uh, rules, rule based systems, um, like uh, the like lookups, uh, lookup table type systems, um, and then just uh, expert systems. When we talk about expert systems, um, I can't spell sys times. It's, it's literally like a subject matter expert or a team of experts custom wrote some software to understand something, but basically <laughs> to, to, under, to, to, to understand the rules well enough to make decisions. So, but these aren't really intelligent systems. They're very fragile and brittle. They're, they're custom created specifically for problem domains. And they've been around for so long and they're everywhere, honestly. Um, if you're doing gaming stuff, this is a lot of the AI that you will use uh, um, or that you might create, you know, to, to, to say, you know, if I look over this direction and I see this type of thing, I'm going to do that. You know, those types of things are you know, rules based. Um, yeah, classic old AI, classic programs like uh, 
I hate to say it, but Watson, IBM Watson is a collection of expert systems type stuff. Uh, something, yeah, you could write an expert system. Absolutely. Um, it, there's not like a criteria, I don't, I don't think, for an expert system. Um, you could write one uh, specifically for a specific reason. Like when you write a chat bot, I've done this before just for fun. You know, if you write a chat bot and it's looking for certain strings in every text that comes through and it might kick off a series of action if it sees this sort of thing or if it sees that. And it might keep a series of states and sort of know what it's been doing recently and use that as a part of its rules to decide what it's going to do next. This is all tricky and fun, but it's not necessarily smart or intelligent. And yes, like what Freeman said, good old fashioned AI sort of. Before you get into the, the Bayesian probabilities and statistics and stuff that come along with neural networks that were, you know, that, uh, that were all those big discoveries uh, in, the, in the end of this last century, um, that is the sort of the next thing. And that is, I would call ANN, simple ANNs maybe. Um, point neurons, let's call it simple ANNs, because I'm going to differentiate, you know, what I think is the next stage. Simple ANNs, um, some people call them point neurons, and, uh, well, the, the units would be, the unit would be a point neuron unit. And this is where you have to, this is tricky for me because I am not a mathematician. I did not go through calculus in high school. I had to understand uh, derivatives and stuff to understand how these sort of neural networks worked. Um, so you might have to do a bit of self-study. Um, and once you get it though, it, it, it makes sense how, how it works. But essentially, it's like population effects. Uh, if, you, if you get a whole, whole bunch of, of neurons and, you, and create millions, thousands, who knows, just a ton, ton of neurons, and, and then you, you connect them together in and we're going to have like simulated, uh, this is like a simulated layer of cells. So this is really inspired by neurobiology uh, in the late, late what, 80s or in the 80s or something. Was, I think we started to, it might have been earlier than that. The perceptron was even earlier than that, I believe. But this was originally, I think, called the perceptron, this idea of, of, a, point, of a point neuron. And essentially it gets, it can be connected to all these different inputs. And at the neuron level, dependent on all these different inputs and their states, right? Each one of these can have a weight. So you could have one weighted really high, one weighted really low. So there's sort of, uh, this thing is, is monitoring all the things it's connected to. And um, its connections have states to, to and, it, and it can use that to decide um, what its state is gonna be. So it decides, what am I gonna be based on this state? And in the end, it's either you know going to activate or not going to activate. Um, and when all of these are doing this at once and you add a whole bunch of layers together, then you get really interesting population dynamics and you can do super cool things. Um, uh, keep in mind though, this is a simple neuron model. The neuron model is basically, I have an output, which is an axon, and I, ha I can have a whole bunch of inputs, which are all basically the same and, and they can have weights. Um, and I decide what, what I'm doing based on those inputs. So what you can do with this, this type of model is take an image, for example, let's say there's someone, we're trying to recognize digits. This is like the classic uh, artificial intelligence, hello world program. It's called MNIST. MNIST, if you want to look it up in M-N-I-S-T. Um, and it's just basically a huge collection of handwritten digits and they're all labeled. So you know, here's one and it's a nine, and here's one and it's a five, et cetera. Um, and uh, so in this case, you might have, you might split this up into pixels, right? And then turn it, put it into an array, you know? So each pixel gets sort of unrolled down this array and, and then we'll create a bunch of neurons, you know, in, in a layer of neurons and have them connect to that input. Okay, so that's, that's like basically a, a way that you can decide, and these guys will start pattern recognize, will start learning sort of to recognize some patterns in, in here. So certain, certain neurons could potentially recognize a, uh, a, a, some combination of, of patterns. And there's lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of tricks. 
uh, in the, and this is, I would call this, uh, it's a type of artificial neural network. When you get into layers upon layers upon layers, that when we're talking about deep learning, okay? So this is, we're in the realm of deep learning right now. There's, there's lots of different tricks you can do. Um, if you want to learn more about the different tricks, there's, there's convolutional neural networks, uh, which I, I don't think I'll describe right now, but uh, maybe that could be a topic of another AI chat in the future. There's uh, generative networks uh, or GANs, which are the big, big thing right now. Uh, I don't have any experience with those. There's reinforcement learning, which is very interesting uh, because with reinforcement learning, and, and the, I guess I should call it deep reinforcement learning, if we're, if we're relating it to neural networks, because you can do reinforcement learning without the deep part. Um, yeah, I think Tachyon is saying, well, I'll use your other name. Uh, yeah, it's, it's all probabilistic, absolutely. The, the deep learning approach is, is, relies heavily on, on, on Bayesian dynamics and probabilities that, uh, that exist there, which is really cool stuff, if you can wrap your head around it. Um, the nice thing is I'm going to talk lots about HTM on this channel and you don't have to understand necessarily that stuff to understand HTM, which is nice. So um, anyway, uh, so let's talk quickly about reinforcement learning because I think it's really cool. Reinforcement learning is not uh, necessarily an artificial neural network. Reinforcement learning is when you have an actor and you have some environment that the actor wants to act upon. So uh, with reinforcement learning, the environment has a state and the state changes over time. Something over here, something over here, whatever. And I can assume like this is reality and this is an actor that is acting upon reality. When the actor acts upon reality, he's, he gets a state back and there's some connection so that you can tell whether you should be rewarded or punished for that action based upon the state. So. There's a, there's a goal reward system here uh, that's really interesting because with H, oh, thank you, Tachyon. I really appreciate it. <laughs> you guys are great. Um, there's a goal reward system here. Um, this works great for HTM. I, I really think that the, there's going to be some huge advancements with, with uh, reinforcement learning with an HTM model. Uh, the current deep Reinforcement learning systems have a deep learning model. But the problem with deep learning models, and I'll get into this in a minute, is that they're best at doing spatial pattern recognition. And in a world where you're taking action and the state of the world is constantly changing, you need to be good at temporal pattern recognition. And HTM is good at temporal pattern recognition. So, but I'll get into that later, I guess. Uh, but yeah. Um, Okay, I got off to a little aside. So the last thing, aside from um, simple neural networks, I would, we would call biological. Uh, and, and this is really anything that's that's going that's learning from neuroscience and trying to apply a, a better or an updated model of neurons and cortical layers. I would call biological uh, neural networks. Um, I'm sure that there are more than just HTM, but HTM is obviously the one that I'm going to talk about a lot. Uh, there, and the main difference here is remember when I told you in a point neuron, there's like, there's an output and then there's a bunch of weights and then it decides based on the state of all these weights and all these things it's connected to, whether it's going to be active or not. The, uh, a real neuron, if you want to get detailed here, a real neuron, let's say, a pyramidal neuron in the brain, and here's this axon, or this is, let's say, this apical dendrites, okay? Um, and then it's got all these dendrites going all over the place. Okay, lots, lots and lots of them. Um, I gotta fill it in. So the thing is, the, there's different receptivity zones here. There's, if, if this neuron is stimulated in different places, it does different things. So if it gets stimulation on these synapses, on these apical dendrites, it might mean one thing. And signals get sent to the soma that indicate, in some cases, indicate uh, that um, something's going on there. If you get 
stimulation close to the cell body. This is proximal. This is proximal. This is apical. And then uh, if you get stimulation close to the cell body, this causes the cell to fire right away. This, this is what causes cells, the cell to fire. And, and for years, we didn't even know why these, others, these other <laughs> dendrites were there. <laughs> so all the rest that are way out, you know, beyond some, some range, these are distal. And, and until recently, we really didn't know what they did or, or what the point was. The, the point is, um, as, anyway, in the HTM neuron model, and, and we think this is continually being backed up by experimental neuroscience research. We're constantly reading papers about this, and this is called an NDMA spike, okay? NDMA spike. If you want to look it up in the neuroscience literature, if one of these segments, distal segments, gets a whole bunch of activity on it, it will send a spike down the dendrite, okay, to the soma, but the soma won't fire. It will just increase its voltage enough so it's really close to firing. And we call this a predictive state. Then the cell is closer to firing than all of its neighbors. So when it does get proximal stimulus, it fires first, first, because it's almost to the threshold of firing. This NDMA spike causes pyramidal neurons to go into its, this predictive state. The point neuron in uh, deep learning networks and other artificial, the simple ANNs, don't have this at all. They've got, uh, there is no predictive state. It's either on or off, and then, you know, or you can have scalar or value associated with it. Um, so the computation occurring here is um, at its core different. Like you, you can't take a deep learning network, right, and just install this, right? Because the deep learning architecture is dependent on the architecture of the perceptron or the, the, the point neuron. So you're changing the functionality of the point neuron itself. You have to change the architectures of all your networks in order to do that and all the frameworks that are running them. So it's not easy to just swap and say, well, we'll just upgrade our deep learning networks to use the HTM neuron model. It just doesn't work that way. Okay. Okay, so we have to talk about spatial versus temporal uh, pattern recognition next. Um, I'll say what happens when a neuron fires after the first one that fired first. So there's a chain of events. If um, so, you've got a real, you've got to think of <clears throat> any any layer of cortex. Let's say here's a layer of cortex. I don't care what it does. It gets some proximal input. Okay, it, it'll it'll get some 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 layers get apical input. Some don't, but some layers will get proximal input, and some will get distal input as well. Um, and you don't know where it's coming from. So if you're, a, if you're a neuron in this layer of cortex, you don't know what your input represents in, in, in any way, um, which is tricky, right? <laughs> so you have an output. So, so one neuron in here might have a proximal connection that comes from over here and, a, and distal connections that come from wherever over there. When it fires, it fires and it has an output, it's a part of this whole layer's output. So it will, it will be a part of that layer's representation. Each layer represents something. If you look at the whole population of cells and what's on at any point in time, that's representing something, right? So this neuron, the fact that it's firing at some point in time represents something in that big population of cells. And we, it's really hard to tell what it represents. It could be a part of a big whole you know, a feature that maybe a, a thousand neurons together will represent. You know what I mean? Um, so to your question, when it fires after the one that fired first, it's just another in the chain of events. So it would go, it would be a part of the input to another layer, or it might be the distal input to another layer. It depends on how you put the layers together. Um, in, our, in our model, you know, uh, there's an HTM school episode on this called cortical circuitry, um, you know, any one of these layers, I, I call them a sort of a compute module. It's got proximal, it's got distal input, and it has an output, and it potentially could have apical input. And if you, if you block them in in different ways, you can, you can connect one to the other and that, this way to that way, and, you know, there's a million things you might do. Knowing that at some point you need to have sensory input 
from the world, right? That's, that's the thing. Sensory input has to come from somewhere and then you create some form of architecture to understand that sensory input. That's the key point, understand it. If you go back to what I was saying earlier, we're trying to create a system that can model the world based on sensory input and movement. So that's another thing. Movement is also part of this, but that's sort of an advanced topic. I'm not gonna talk about that today. Okay. Um, thanks everybody for watching. Um, does the apical input also predict or help with the voltage? So in, our, uh, in the Columns Plus paper, we modeled apical input. Uh, this, is, this is getting kind of deep, but in, in our Columns Plus paper, I can remember this properly. So we, we have this three, three model, three, I don't want to get into this right now. Let, I'm going to skip that question, Falco. Ask it on the forum, okay? <laughs> Sorry to do that. It's too deep. It's too deep for chat session. Uh, that's like a very specific HTM question. Um, no, no worries. Um, spatial analysis versus temporal analysis. Um, so most of the things that current weak AI systems like uh, deep learning pattern uh, uh, video, um, sorry, deep learning image classification systems like your Google uh, Photos or your Facebook, you know, face recognition, voice recognition, all of that stuff uses deep learning and it uses spatial analysis tools. So, uh, and what I mean by that is if you've got a corpus of images, let's say you've got like ImageNet is one that has just, I don't know how many, millions and millions of images and each image, it's got a list of labels. So this one has a cat and a dog and a, and a house and a, a badger, I don't know. It just, it lists all the things, water, tree. So, so each one of these images um, will have a human created label. Like these, when, when you go through, yeah, this is machine intelligence. Machine intelligence. <laughs> we, so when you go through here, uh, humans have gone through this whole thing and labeled them, right? This is something that Google pays people to do is to label their data sets because we don't have anything that can understand label sets in order to label them, right? So we need labeled data sets so we can train deep learning systems. Because if you've got a million photos of dogs, then, and you run each one of those, like you can run whole batches, thousands of pictures, right? And there's, there's a way that you can map it out. Usually they do this with convolutional neural networks, which I, which I don't want to get into hugely, but you can take, you know, every image you get and you create, you know, these uh, whole bunch of kernels or convolutions that, that look at different sections and each one looks at a different section. They're all trying to do feature recognition in some portion of the, of the, um, of the space. Um, you can talk about channels and how much information is embedded in each, pic each pixel. There's, there's a ton of ways to extract information or to encode information in images. Um, in a way that they eventually are going to be represented by a big old array of point neurons, right? That's, that's the end result of this is you're going to have a point neuron that, that, that lights up whenever it sees certain things in an image. Uh, and you do this by training, and, and I'm not going to get into backpropagation, but you, you, you do this by training a, a one of these networks that you've created and telling it at the end, every time you show it something, um, you allow it to know if it was right or wrong and what it classified it to be. And then you take that error and you do some form of credit assignment to identify which neurons contributed to the accuracy of that error and you, uh, or accuracy of that classification. And you back propagate the error all the way through your network. And it's a huge computational cost to, to do that. And, there's, and, it, and it doesn't happen like that in the brain. Um, but it works. And so you can have this guy learn to see specific features of, 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 uh, of things in, in the images. So you might have this guy at a, at that all he ever recognizes is, is left facing <laughs> floppy dog ears. I don't know. <laughs> or left facing floppy ears. It might not even be on a dog. And then you might have one over here that, that, that always is really good at seeing wet noses. <laughs> You know, it, it's really hard to say because the features are so abstract, right? 
Um, so the combination of these, when you start adding, you know, uh, a bunch, a bunch of hidden layers, because you, you can add as many hidden layers as you want, is you're just constantly refining these into sort of, you can, you can decrease the size of the features you're getting at. So at the end, you can have a classification of the most commonly seen things like dog or cat, right? The things that people are actually labeling. Uh, that's spatial pattern recognition and, that, and deep learning systems are really good at that. But what happens when the problem is not spatial? What happens when it's a video? Then this system cannot process this in a temporal way. What it, this will, uh, and all of our like TensorFlow and PyTorch, all those systems are happy to, to process all this, but it wants huge batches of images and it's gonna train on a bunch of, a huge batch at a time and call that an epoch and they'll go back and they'll do back propagation of error and they'll just, and they'll, they'll tune everything and, and increase the, the, uh, the quality of all the parameters and then run it again and then train again. And every time they do that, they're refining the parameters and training it again, and then you do it again, and you get to a point where you're happy with the classification performance, and you put that model into production. That model will no longer learn ever again. It does not learn. It learned when you trained it, and it learned on all the spatial stuff that it saw, but it has no perception of what came after the next thing, because it's just doing batch processing of spatial input. So, it has no idea what uh, time is, um, which is totally different from you and me and every other thing that lives and thinks and moves on this planet. Our brains all evolved specifically to react, to, to move through space. And time is a key component of that. Um, so we need a temporal pattern recognition. And we try and do it the way the brain does it. Um, and the problem with current deep learning systems, and, and yes, there are uh, some types of um, like deep learning, like LSTM, long short-term memory, <laughs> which is a funny name, uh, and something else that I read recently uh, that are trying to do temporal pattern recognition, but they're all just doing it in batches. You know, it's, it's hacking deep learning spatial, what it's good at, which is spatial pattern recognition, and it's trying to hack it. it. It seems like a hack to me. You have to run everything in batches. What you need is an online learning system. Online learning means that every new piece of information you get, you learn from it right away. You don't have to, you know, um, like, uh, like for instance, um, photo classification, if you go to Google Photos, they are constantly in the background, you don't know this, but they're going through all your new photos when they see them and they're updating their model and then they're redeploying it, okay? <laughs> hey, thanks for the follow, Sans Asteroids. I appreciate it. Um, this is my first live follow. So if anybody's watching and they haven't followed, it'd be awesome if you did. I'm trying to get some people interested in artificial intelligence on Twitch. There seems to be a, 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 an interest there, so. Um, Anyway, so I was talking about spatial versus temporal pattern recognition. Um, uh, so <laughs> deep learning is bad at spa uh, temporal pattern recognition because there's no sense of time. There's no link between one sample and the next sample, right? Um, so uh, that's one, one thing. Oh, so you might ask, how do you do voice, right? How do you do voice recognition? Because, or like Shazam, um, that, that service that you listen to a part of a song and it'll say, oh, that's, that's uh, you know, whatever song it is. Um, so in all those cases that I've ever investigated, what you'd end up doing is taking a sample of some temporal stream of data and then running a spatial pattern recognition analysis on it. So like you'll do a, a Fourier transform on like an audio file to break it up into frequency bins, or you'll do a spectrogram analysis um, or something like that uh, of a voice file. Uh, and then what that essentially does is it gives you a spatial representation of, of it temporally. It'll actually you know, draw it out over time and you'll get a little image. And so you can do spatial image recognition and pattern, pattern matching on that image. Because what you can do like for Shazam, for example, um, you can have different 
signatures for different windows in the song. And if you do that off ahead of time and you have those easily indexed, whenever anybody sends you one, all you have to do is match it against those. And uh, so I think that's the type of stuff it's doing. It's not really doing truly temporal pattern recognition. Um, so there's ways to do it without, <clears throat> yeah, but you, you basically transform it into a spatial problem. Um, okay, so let's talk about AI and game development a little bit, since um, hopefully there's some people from Twitch that are interested in that. Um, some of the, and I'll just throw out some ideas, and if anyone has something interesting they want to, uh, <clears throat> to bring up, um, then go for it. But so some of the obvious places I think that you could do, FFT, FFT could be used in the encoding process, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I've uh, always used FFT. See, I've used FFT to encode input um, from audio. There's this video of me on YouTube doing it. I got a whole bunch of views from it because of the band that I was playing in the background <laughs> posted it out on Facebook. Um, anyway, but that's an FFT that, uh, yeah, it was sleep. <laughs> that was an FFT, Fast Fourier Transform, and it just cuts it up into fre frequency bins. And I created 10 models. I created one model for each frequency bin. And try. And this is an old, uh, I could probably do a better job now if I tried this. So, um, yeah, I can find a link. Here, let's do it. I'll help you find a link. It's gonna be on the forum, oh no, no wait. Uh, it's called Nupic Critic Sound Analysis. There it is, Nupic Critic. Yeah, and there's there's the video. <laughs> okay. Uh, but this is old stuff. This is years ago. I did this like five years ago, so it might not be the best quality stuff. Um, do I think it could be used in a music generator? Uh, you mean HTM? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, at some point, yeah. I think there's a lot of opportunity to use HTM with music uh, just because of the, it's an it's a excellent sequence um, analyzer. You know, it can, it can tell, the, the thing that would be great, and I'm going off on a tangent here, is the thing that would be great is if we could do a sequence pooling over top of it. And, and this was just recently discussed in the forum, it comes up all the time. But you, you can't easily, at any point in time, um, you can make a prediction. You can get a prediction of what you think is coming next, but going into the cell, the cell state, and trying to extract what sequences could I currently be in, what's contributing to this prediction, that's hard to do. Um, yeah, so you guys uh, chat on the forum, connect on the forum. There's private messages there. This would be a great place to do it. Um, where was I? Oh, oh, game development. Uh, so a couple of things. Okay, obviously enemy control. Um, and there's some really interesting stuff going on right now in HTM and in neuroscience involving grid cells. Uh, and I will show you again, um, if you search grid cells, uh, go to videos, here's a video of grid cells. This is me. It's taking me a while. <laughs> so, but go, I'll, I'll paste this in chat here. Um, this is super exciting. For those of you who aren't following the HTM community, uh, everybody else knows how crazy I am about this. This is so cool. Um, so th these scientists won Nobel Prize for this, I think, in 2014. 2014, right? Yeah, I think so. Um, so they found cells, and I'll do an episode on this for sure. We'll do a neuroscience chat uh, about this in the future, and I'll go into detail. But um, you can represent space with these cells. And that's what's so exciting about like game development because I'm, we're starting to think like in ways of um, navigating through different dimensional spaces, which is very cool. Uh, so when you think about enemy control you, and you think about how would you model that enemy, what is that enemy's model? In current AI systems for, for game devs, I don't think those enemies really have models. I think they just have rules. I think they're mostly like expert systems that um, have like a canned enemy behavior, but they don't learn from, you know, the environments. They don't learn over time. With a proper HTM model, that's, you know, a temporal model that uh, updates as a, an enemy moves through the space of the game, you would have something that could potentially learn 
um, learn uh, the environment as it goes along, even other people's movements or other enemies' movements. Um, I don't know what pathfinding is. Are you talking about path integration? Um, flipping positions. Use HTM as the game master game platform that controls the rules of the world depending on what kind of rules we pre-taught them. I, you lost me there. Maybe that's, that's over my head. I'm not sure. Maybe that's step two. Yeah, that could be a step two. I, I, you could use HTM to model a whole environment, but the thing is, and this is a tricky thing, if you're going to go this route, um, you have to have movement baked into the system. Like you have to, if you're going to create an, every intelligent thing that has ever existed has had the ability to move through its environment. So we need to know, we need to understand how movement contributes to intelligence. And that's one of like the core research things that we do in my company is try to understand how movement, um, yeah. Modeling the environment's a hard problem. That's, that's it, it, deep learning is, is not necessarily uh, model heavy. Um, and it's model heavy in some ways, but not, it doesn't like create a model of the world. You need a model of the world of reality, not just like an input space, you know? Um, anyway, uh, enemy control. Okay. Um, environment control. That was a, another thing I, I wanted to talk about. So if you're going to, and you could do, um, this could be like, uh, like I said, if, if an environment, say a room, if you're, if you're creating a level, you might model the whole level. If the level has things it could do, like doors that automatically close and open or traps that go off at certain times, you could potentially create a model for the level itself and it can get as input the movement of the player through the level, you know, and that, and it can choose on how to respond based upon that. Uh, but the thing that we're also, this would go, pair well with reinforcement learning because what we're missing in HTM is is um, is an ag is agency essentially HTM has a is, creates a model it's a model of the neocortex so it creates a sensory motor model of the world based upon movements through space it creates representations of the objects you've interacted with and the space that you've interacted with um, but it doesn't generate the movements necessarily we still have to figure out how to how to incorporate this with reinforcement learning systems that generate movements um, okay, or use already made open world games and generate quests. Yeah, yeah, you could do any, any time. So just for deep learning systems, anytime you have a, just a buttload of data, like if you, if you have like, uh, 10,000 levels in a game or, or in an old game or something like that, you could potentially figure out how to train um, uh, a model on that, on classifying something on that so that you can generate new levels. So maybe level generation, but yes, reinforcement learning and HTM is, is a huge deal, I think. And we're not even working on it right now as far as actually Lewis might be, I'm not sure. <coughs> um, so no, uh, so does it, so this is theoretically, okay. Um, but theoretically, um, you do not need to know where you are in the world to learn where you are or to learn your environment. You build it around you. And then once you recognize it, think about like, uh, think about like you open your eyes in a strange room. You don't have to know where you are to create a representation of that room in your brain. Um, let's say you walk out the door and you recognize, oh, I'm on 10th street and I'm on that building that I never walked in before. You, there's a there's a re-anchoring that occurs here. Okay, you have to you have to understand something called place cells in addition to grid cells. And I haven't talked about place cells at all, and I barely talked about grid cells. But place cells are cells that respond to like certain landmarks. So they're like broader in scope. So when you walk out the door, you might see the cell phone tower across the street, which is a landmark that says, "Oh, I'm on Fifth Street." Whatever that that just anchored you to a place that you've been before. They're, your grid cells operate within that place area. So they map space out normally, no matter where you are. Um, so it needs a certain level of detail and input. Absolutely. You have to, that's pattern matching. And, and it's not just spatial, it's temporal, spatial temporal pattern matching. And it's the same thing with objects as it is with environments. Imagine 
this object is an environment and I want to recognize what environment I'm in. I do that and, and, and I don't even have eyes. I'm just going to do it by touching it. If I touch it like this, I don't know what it is because I've only touched one thing. I've got some information. Pattern matching is definitely a hard problem. Uh, so, but when I touch it like this, I've got some information. It's not, <laughs> this is not a Nementa cup. I don't have one in the office, sorry. Um, but when I move along it, when I move, I can feel, I can, I can tell, oh, I, I know what that is. This is probably one of a few things. And then if I use my whole hand, even without opening my eyes, I know exactly what it is because I've held this thing a million times before. Not a million. But, um, but you do that by moving your sensors through an object space and then matching on all the things, all the different things that have felt like that in that space before, right? That's sort of a key to uh, HTM theory and Dementis theory. We have a bunch of videos about this if you want to learn more. Uh, the YouTube page is linked in the Twitch channel. Um, so you can go there to find, to find out more. Uh, specifically, that particular problem, the, la the latest video is called Framework, a framework for intelligence, something like that. Um, yeah, 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 that's a good point. All the inputs are relative to each other. So you're not only modeling an object in space, you're modeling your sensors in space too. And, and where they are in, in relation to each other. Um, and they're all informing each other. Like you can, if, if you put two, you're gonna recognize something faster by grabbing it all at once with all four or five fingers than, than touching it one at a time. You know, you know what I mean? Than, than doing like, like that, that doesn't make sense. But when they all inform each other, then you immediately know it's a cylinder. If you were to go like this, it, it might not be so obvious. You know, but if you go like that, you get all at the same time and they can all compare the representations and of, of their input and their output. Well, they compare the representations of their output, but that's a deeper topic. Um, uh, so either a high level of detail, five fingers or long term memory to be able to combine a lot of observations. Yes, yes, you got it. <laughs> okay, so that, um, where was I? Uh, oh, game development, right. We t uh, modeling the players uh, is another way to do it. You could create a model that uh, just for the current player, and it could evolve over time. You know, you, you create it, it, it follows the player along on their journey or whatever. So you can learn potentially things like, uh, I, I don't know, I guess preferences, but it's not just spatial preferences. It's like, oh, they've done these few actions. Usually they're going to do this next. So if you can get it an indication of they're likely to do this next or that next, that might be really useful in a game because then you can shock the hell out of them <laughs> and they won't know what's coming. Um, yeah, learning the type of player it is. Here's one thing, here's something that we do that, I, that I've done quite a few times. So there's something you can do in HTM, which is create an anomaly model. Um, and let, let me, uh, maybe I should turn or turn, no, not that one, this one. Um, so, so as this is kind of cool, I, I've actually done this in Minecraft. So let's say this is like a Minecraft world and I've got a house over here and a tree or whatever. And, um, I've got this track and I go over here, whatever. And I just run this track, run it, run it, run it, run it, run it, run it. Run it. So we have a way to, and, and then there's an H there's a video on the YouTube channel, search for Minecraft and you'll find it that where I did this and I showed an anomaly indication as I ran around the track and ran around the track and ran around the track. And that's just, it, it, it shows you at least that you can, it, I showed that like after I ran around a few times and then I did something weird or I ran off this direction or that direction or I jumped way up in the air, or I just slowed down. The, the anomaly indication would go up and you could tell that I was doing something different than I had been doing for the past few minutes, um, which is interesting. And you can do that today with HTM stuff. Um, in the same, we use the same tactic for other things, not just position. Um, um, I'll get to your question in a, in a minute um, in cognition. Um, we, what we will do is, is we might have a stream of data and, and, uh, that's coming in, and there might be different patterns of activity that we know we want to recognize. So here's one pattern, here's one pattern, I don't know, there's one pattern, something like that. And, and we know this is some type of classification, but it's never exact, you know? It's just like we know this is one pattern of, of activity, this is another pattern of activity. And if we want to do that type of temporal classification, we could do it 
if there's a finite number of these patterns, because we could train one model on, on this pattern only. We can train one model on this pattern only and one model on this pattern only. So the only things that these have seen is just that class of input. And then we'll run, when we have an actual input, uh, like, like that, when we have an actual input, we run it through all the models, model one, model two, model three, and each one is going to output an anomaly score. This one might be 0 0.999. This one might, might not be 0 0.95. It's just anomaly likelihood, technically. But And this one might be, that's a weird, that's not what I meant. Nine, 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 whatever. One, the one that is the lowest would be your classification, which is the, the pattern that it's most similar to. Um, and this works pretty well, uh, but it's sort of model intensive because if you've got a thousand classifications of pattern that you want to recognize, you have to create a thousand models and run them all simultaneously to do this. Um, okay, the question in cognition had, I uh, just joined a few minutes ago. I was wondering what your company applies HTM to. We don't apply HTM to anything. Um, and I'm, I say that proudly. <laughs> Um, we are interested in understanding how intelligence works in the brain and simulating that in non-biological systems. We hope that uh, people are inspired by our research to create things using HTM technology. We make all of our code open source under an AGPL license, so you can do whatever you want with it in research settings, scientific settings. Um, uh, but if you do end up creating products with that, that code, we, there is a license involved. Um, but, uh, but we don't actually build anything. We're just, we're just doing the research and trying to figure out the core science of it. And that's, that's really what Jeff wants to do. Jeff Hawkins is our, our founder. Um, he, he founded Palm and Handspring. He invented the Palm Pilot. You know, this is claim to fame, which is, which is a big, pretty big deal at the time. Um, and he, you know, invented graffiti. Some of the old heads will probably re remember graffiti. Some people just loved it so much. Anyway. Um, he uh, pretty much funds our company and our research, uh, so that is his goal, is to understand intelligence. Yeah, the godfather of smartphones. Right, read on intelligence if you're interested. He wrote that book. That's why I work here. I read that book back in Missouri when I was, grow when I was uh, working in software 10 years ago. And um, I work for Nementa now because of that book. I thought it was so interesting, and I was like, that's the problem I want to work on. Um, Okay, anyway, back to the, uh, the topic. We're still talking about AI and game development. Uh, we talked about enemy control, uh, modeling the environment and environmental actions, um, and modeling different players. Uh, I talked about generating levels. So another way you could use it that you could do it today with today's deep learning technology is creating graphics, especially if you've got like NPCs. Have you seen, uh, you can go look on, on YouTube or, or or whatever, there's a lot of memes about it now, but they've got um, um, AI systems that can just create a face. What is the URL of that? There, there's a, it says this face is not real or this person is not real.com or whatever, somebody will find it for me. Um, but it will just generate a face for you and it'll look like a real person. Unless you look really hard, it'll look like a real person. And you can't tell that it's not a real person. Like it looks really good. Um, and that's cool for games, right? Because you don't have to do that just for people. You could do that for buildings. You could do that for grass. You could do it for trees. You could create all kinds of, of artifacts in the game that are sort of pseudo, there, there it is. This person does not exist.com. Let's look at this. Let me bring it over here. There we go. There's a kid that does not exist. And every time you refresh it, let's see, there's another person that does not exist. Now, if you start looking really closely at these, you'll recognize some interesting things like this woman has a tooth in the middle of her face. How did that get there? <laughs> Hold on, I got I to gotta move the chat. There it is. <laughs> any, uh, any, my, chat, my chat's not working on this, whatever. Uh, and, and if you keep doing it, like you'll see some weird, really weird stuff. Uh, like eyes will be different. Like these eyes there's something wrong about those eyes and especially with hair and earrings sometimes you'll get one earring that looks totally different 
and can this is a pretty good one um but and then another one will like look like it came from outer space here's something like what is this right here you can't really tell what it is it might be part of an earring but that's the sort of thing that a generative model will do and again she's got like a tooth right in the middle of her face <laughs> it'll uh it doesn't quite know it doesn't know what an earring is it doesn't know what a scarf is but if it sees like enough, if it, but it might put together pieces of each and think that it makes sense, right? That, that's what you see in, in stuff like this. It's not really understanding people or objects. It's just like just generating things based on all of the different observations and, and the probabilities of having those observations together in the same place before. Interesting stuff. I mean, this is really cool. You could do uh, a lot with this, I think. Um, so that's, so that's something you could do for like creating NPCs, uh, ton, tons of stuff. And, and you could do that right now with deep learning models and you could train the model sort of while you're producing the software and serialize it and you know, deploy it with the system. It would not be able to learn in real time. Um, I don't think any of this stuff is gonna be able to learn in real time because you'll, you have to retrain it and redeploy it on your running software and I don't think that really is gonna work very well with a game. Um, uh, Tachyon says, yeah, the twirlies. Yeah, there's a lot of weird twirly things. And, the, and there's a lot of weird things with hair. You'll see hair that's really strange. Um, uh, yeah, imagine what would an AI system could do if it was aware of our experiences. Absolutely. Uh, it's, yeah, the, the AI systems are really good at mimicking things. So if you, if you train it on a bunch of sad music, it'll generate a sad song. And it might make you cry. But... Some of those sad songs it trained on were going to make you cry too, right? So, um, yeah, here's the best one. Oh, God. <laughs> somebody, somebody showed me the picture of a cat. Yeah, there's some really wacky stuff coming out of that. Um, okay, so I'm done with this stream. I'm, I'm coming up on an hour. I think I'll take a few more questions if you want to. What, what I would like to try and do is raid another channel. And I, I've never done this before. So I have to figure out how it even works. Um, and I think I can do it with the chat. Uh, and, but now I have to figure out like who's online. Hey, thanks for the, for the compliment. I'm gonna do this every week. Every Monday we'll talk about something else. And it may not be, I might not have a huge agenda, but um, especially if I get voice working, uh, maybe it could just be a time for me to chat with the community, whoever is interested in, in talking about machine intelligence or AI, whatever you want to call it. Um, and uh, let's see, so I'm gonna go, so if you, if, you're, if you like Twitch, there's a science and technology, uh, who do I know that's online right now? There's a science and technology game, it's not really a game. Uh, yeah, by uh, Dairik, Dairik. <laughs> um, good luck on your test. Let's send, I'm gonna send some, we could, so when you, when you raid another channel, it's like you send all of the people that are currently watching your channel to another channel. So I'm thinking about going to this guy named Rhyme You, uh, because he, he seemed nice and he signed up to, to, for my channel. And he's, um, he's got some really cool, uh, really clean code. So I respect clean code. He's got really well commented code and he does all the uh, TDD stuff. Hey, Nerve Fever. Thank you for the follow. I appreciate it. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to raid another channel. So I think, is it, is it, I, I really don't know if, I'm, could somebody know how to do this? I'm going to have to look it up. Uh, how to raid Twitch channel. How to raid a Twitch channel. Okay. How to use raids. Uh, oh, it's just slash raid channel name. Raid. Let's try it. I did it. Is it going to work? Uh, let's see. I have no idea if this is going to work. T -t 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 dashboard. It, it looks like it did it. Yeah, they're ready to raid. Okay, here it goes. Seven seconds. We're going to raid his channel. Thanks, everybody, for watching. It's been uh, a pleasure. I'll be back. I'll be live streaming tomorrow, just my normal stuff. So um, let's go. We're going to raid now. Take care.
host nowadays. I think it's something that streamer owns. I guess both the raid and the host go for this. How are you guys doing? Should I explain what the heck I'm doing? What is this guy doing? I am trying to build a platform for a player game. And that link will bring you to this page with a little, little bit more info. But um, I don't have the game ready yet because I, uh, I'm doing a lot of stuff from scratch. And so I'm building up my own platform for building a game on top that is server based. And today the whole focus is refactoring the server code. Because <coughs> one of the components that I'm working on called the coordinator, which you can see in this diagram, is this part of my server. It's pretty complicated and messy, and I'm trying to clean it up. So the overall architecture, multiplayer server game, you uh, are controlling your end, like the player, will be controlling it through a client. In my case, it's a, uh, a JavaScript in the browser, and the server end is running in the cloud somewhere, and there's messages between servers and clients, and between servers and each other. And so I'm hitting a lot of the code today that is dealing with the messages that can be sent by different entities. So administrators.